the Lord. Hallelujah. Welcome to tonight's service. I hope you have your pens, your notebooks, your electronic devices with which you can take notes and make sure you have a Bible by you. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for the opportunity to sit at your feet and learn. The Bible says they will be taught of God. We ask that you will instruct us tonight. Holy Spirit, we ask that you open our understanding. Grant us knowledge. Open our minds, our eyes of understanding to be able to comprehend your word. The psalmist says, open my eyes to behold the wonders of your law. Lord, open our eyes tonight that we may be able to understand the things that are enshrined in your law. Anoint my leaves of clay. Make my tongue like the pen of a ready writer. Enable me to speak your word as I ought to speak it in the name of Jesus. I ask that you grant my audience clear-cut understanding. Grant them the Give them hearing ears. Give them a mind that can that can receive your word. A mind that can accept your word in the name of Jesus. Thank you, precious Father. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Good evening and God bless you. I trust that you've had a wonderful day. I trust that your day has been fruitful. It has been blessed. It has been progressive. Hallelujah. Tonight... We want to continue on our subjects titled This God Called Money. Praise the Lord. We've been studying these subjects for some time now. It's actually an exposition on Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. Praise the Lord. Now we've been looking at three propositions. As a matter of fact, we'll be looking at the fourth today. Praise the Lord. The first proposition was Mammon is a master. And I encourage you, please, listen to the previous broadcast. Time will fill me to go through, to give a recap of all we've done up till now. But I'd like to go through the propositions we've made. The first is Mammon is a master. Hallelujah. The second is Mammon seeks to take the place of God in your life. Praise the Lord. The third is a believer is either worshipping God or worshipping mammon, but he cannot do both. Praise the Lord. Either you are worshipping God or you are worshipping mammon. But Jesus, Jesus said you cannot worship God and mammon. Praise the Lord. Now, in one of our previous teachings, or in our previous teachings, we have defined what mammon is. Hallelujah. We said mammon is a disapproving way of talking about riches and wealth when it becomes the focus, the most important thing in a person's life. When it becomes literally a God in a person's life. Praise the Lord. So today we'll be looking at our fourth proposition, which is your loyalty a person's true loyalty will always be determined by his or her attitude towards money and his or her handling of money. Praise the Lord. Your, your loyalty, your true loyalty to God will always be determined by your attitude or will be displayed by your attitude towards money. Praise the Lord. And then the way you handle money. Hallelujah. Now, money is a servant. Make no mistake about that. Money is a servant. But this is one servant that seeks to be a master. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The purpose for money, the purpose designed for money is to serve you, to serve me, to serve every individual. But money desires that you serve it. Amen. So money was designed to serve you 
and not you to serve it. Money was designed to work for you and not you to work for money. Praise the Lord. Money was designed to fulfill a purpose in your life and not to be the very purpose of your life. Are we together? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Money becomes your master the moment the purpose it was meant to achieve or fulfill in your life is overtaken by it becoming the purpose of your life. I'll take that again. Money becomes your master when the purpose for which money was designed to fulfill in your life is overtaken by money becoming the purpose of your life. Praise the Lord. Now, the purpose of money is to provide goods and services. Praise the Lord. Money is a medium of exchange. Money was brought into the fore. Money was invented to make trade easier. So the purpose of money is to enable you procure goods and services. Praise the Lord. That is the purpose of money. Amen. And then also to help you accomplish the purpose of God for your life. Praise the Lord. But when money moves from that purpose to becoming the essence, the purpose for which you live, then money has moved from being a servant to becoming your master. Praise the Lord. Now, if we are to be truthful, one of the challenges of today's church is that it has become monetized. Amen. Money has become the central theme of the church today. It is the objective for which many come to church. Hallelujah. It's the objective for which many are in the ministry. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Money has very quickly taken the place of God in the life of so many of us. Praise the name of the Lord. Money has become the measure of success, the measure of achievement, the measure of accomplishment, which is not supposed to be so for a child of God. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, having said all this, we want to look at what the money, what the Bible has to say about money. In light of some of these things we've said, in, some, in light of some of these claims we've made, what is the Bible's view? Praise the Lord. Should money become the yardstick of success? Should money become the focus of our lives? Remember, we're talking about our attitude towards money and it's revealing who it is we serve or who we are loyal to. Praise the Lord. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 5, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 5, I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Praise the Lord. I read, he said, these people always cause trouble. He said, their minds are corrupt and they have turned their backs on the truth. I'd like you to take note of that. He said, to them, a show of godliness is just a way to become wealthy. Praise the Lord. You see, they have turned their backs to what? To the truth. Amen. They have turned their backs on the truth. Why? Because in their minds, money or godliness, being righteous, working with God, is a means to make money. They are in church to prosper. And interestingly, the Bible says, anyone who is in this category praise the Lord, has turned his or her back from the truth. Hallelujah. Anyone who is in church or sees Christianity as a means to becoming rich or to prosper financially, the Bible says he or she has turned his or her back from the truth. Hallelujah. Let's look at the Good News Translation. I believe it will throw more light. Glory to God. We we'll read verse 5 and 6 in the Good News Translation. You see, and constant arguments from people whose minds do not function and who no longer have the truth. You see, whose minds do not function and who no longer have the truth. You see, they think that religion is a way to become rich. Amen. 
They think that religion is a way to become rich. And what does the Bible say about such people? He says they no longer are in the truth. They've strayed from the path of righteousness. Hallelujah. You see, their minds are not functioning as it ought to function. Praise the Lord. Now, verse 6 says, Well, religion does make a person very rich. But there's a caveat. You see, if he is satisfied with what he has, glory to God. The place you give to money, the place you give money in your life is an indication as to whom you truly serve. The space, the honor, the room you give money in your life is an indication as to who you really serve and to whom you are loyal to. Praise the Lord. If money takes the center stage in your life, it doesn't matter how many times you speak in tongues, how many hours you speak in tongues, money is who you are serving. Money who is, is who you are loyal to. Hallelujah. In Luke chapter 12, verse 15, Luke 12 and verse 15, praise the Lord. And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Praise the Lord. Now, the occasion of this verse was that someone came to the Lord Jesus and said to him, Master, please ask my brother to share our father's inheritance with me. And Jesus said, Man, who made me an arbitrator between you and and your brother. Then he turned to his disciples and said, Look, take heed, beware of covetousness. Why? The value of a person's life is not measured by what he has. So when we when, when we make money the standard of success, the standard of accomplishment, the standard of achievement, praise the Lord, for a child of God, we are highly mistaken. Jesus said, That is not what determines the measure of your life. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God in the highest. The good news says a person's true life is not made up of the things he owns. No matter how rich he is. So you can have all the money in the world and you are valueless. Your life is valueless. What gives your life value is impact. Amen. Amen. Fulfillment of divine purpose. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, why do we look for money? Why do we want money? What purpose does money serve in a person's life? Why do we seek it? Why do we really want money? Praise the Lord. Like I said before, money is a medium of exchange. We need money to have free access to the things we desire. Hallelujah. When I want something, I want the money to be able to get it. So the reason you and I want money is to be able to get all our heart desires. Praise the Lord. I am not wanting anybody to tell us no. We don't want anyone or anything to impede that access which we desire for the things we want. Praise the Lord. We don't want to be denied what we want. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, having said that, I need you to understand. You know, we're talking about your attitude towards money and your handling of it. And it's, you know, the proof of who, where your loyalty lies. Praise the Lord. Now, in Mark chapter 10, verse 23 and 24, Mark 10, verse 23 and 24, I read, Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard... It is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. How difficult it is. Praise the Lord. Verse 24 says, And his disciples were astonished at his words. How can you say that a rich man, it will be difficult for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God? Praise the Lord. And then he further went on to explain and said, how hard it is for those who trust in riches 
to enter the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord. Now, what was Jesus saying to us? Hallelujah. He was actually saying that those who have money trust in their riches. The more money you accumulate, the more money you gather, the more, the greater the tendency to trust in money. Praise the Lord. He was saying rich people trust in their money, not in God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, if I were to ask you, when you didn't have those times you were trusting God for something, you were doing so because you didn't have the money. Praise the Lord. You wanted maybe a phone, you wanted a car, you wanted a house. You trusted God for it, you believed God for it, you prayed about it. Why? Because you didn't have the money. But when you had the money, you never went back to God to ask him. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17, the Bible says, Command those who are rich in this, in this present age not to be haughty, not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. What is the Bible saying? The Bible is simply saying, do not trust in money, but trust in God to provide what you need. What the Bible is saying is that God should be our source, not money. Praise the Lord. I'll read the contemporary English version for clarity. It says, warn the rich people of this world not to be proud or to trust in wealth that is easily lost. Tell them to have faith in God who is rich and blesses us with everything we need to enjoy life. So the things you and I need are supposed to come via blessings, not through money. Praise the Lord. So God wants to be your source and mine, and not money to be our source. Philippians chapter 4 verse 19, But my God shall supply all your need, according to what his riches, not according to your money. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God in the highest. Hallelujah. Now, how many of us remember to ask God? How many of us remember to turn to God and ask him for things that we have the money to purchase? We don't do that. Very few of us do that. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Giving is one of the things that proves where your loyalty lies. Hallelujah. Giving. What is your attitude towards giving? Praise the Lord. Giving is one of those things that proves where your loyalty lies. Hallelujah. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 and 18, the Bible says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Amen. He said, Let them do good that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Praise the Lord. After saying, don't put your trust in money, but trust in God, what was the next thing he said? He said, give. Praise the Lord. So the proof of where your trust is, is in your ability to give. In your willingness to give. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God in the highest. Hallelujah. Now, on what premise did the Lord Jesus make this statement that we saw in Mark chapter 10, verses 23 and 24. Let's look at Mark 10, from verse 17 to 27, so that you can get a bird's eye view of it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, 
Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished, saying, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Hallelujah. Why did the disciples say, Who then can be saved? Because they themselves discovered they put their trust in riches. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So what was Jesus saying? The reason that young man found it extremely difficult to give out what he had was because his trust was in riches. His trust was in the money he had. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And not in God. Those whose confidence, those whose trust are in God, they give out readily. Those whose trust is in money find it difficult to give. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. So the problem most of us have when it comes to the issue of tithing and giving is not whether it is doctrinally, you know, correct. I hear a lot of talk, um, this is tithing, is Old Testament, is under the law. Listen to me, child of God. It's not about whether it's under the law. The problem actually is where your loyalty lies. Praise the Lord. You are giving those excuses not because it's Old Testament, but because that is, you know, it is challenging your loyalty. You are not loyal towards God. You don't trust God. I remember when I first got born again, coming from a denomination where there was nothing like tithes. I'd never heard of the word tithes. And I was madly, I was deeply in love with God deep fellowship with him and you know I, I, coming from that perspective I was struggling with the tithe and one day the Lord spoke to me and said to me you know you don't love me and I was so heartbroken how can you say I don't love you you know how my heart yearns for you and you know what he said to me he said but you can't trust me with your money you can't trust me with your money the reason many of us have difficulties in giving is we don't trust God. Our heart is disloyal to Him. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Let's look at Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. Then we'll proceed to look at verse 11 and 12. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now, how did God test Abraham? The Bible says God tested Abraham. Praise the Lord. What was God testing? God was testing Abraham's loyalty to him. Hallelujah. And what did God say? God said, bring your son. Your only son Isaac, whom you love. Now God waited till Ishmael had gone. God told him, send Ishmael away. And after Abraham's heart had gotten taken over by Isaac, he said, bring the Isaac who you love. Amen. God tested Abraham's loyalty by what? By his willingness and his readiness to give. 
even that which was most precious to him. So giving is a test of loyalty. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He wanted to know if Abraham would be willing to part with every and anything in his honor of God. Let's go to verse 11. I will see how Abraham fared in that test. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that mm. you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Now I know that you fear God. And how did I know? You have not withheld from me. You have not withheld from me. So those who withhold from God do not fear him. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Those who do not, who, who withhold the gift, the offering, those who withhold the tithe, the truth is they do not fear God. Glory to God. So when it comes to money, when it comes to God and money, who takes the back seat and who takes the front seat? Hallelujah. In Luke 16, verse 11, Luke 16, verse 11, I read, it said, Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And I'd like you to take note of this. Financial prosperity is a trust. Financial prosperity is a sacred trust. One for which not only is faithfulness demanded, but accountability will be required before God. Hallelujah. The New Living Translation says, If you are untrustworthy with worldly wealth, he said, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? Child of God, it matters to God how and on what you use or spend your money. Praise the Lord. James chapter 5 verse 1, I'll read the Amplified Translation. Come quickly now, you rich, who lack true faith and hold and misuse your resources. Weep and howl over the miseries, the woes, the judgments that are coming upon you. Praise the Lord. He says, when a man lacks true faith, what happens? He hoards and misuses the resources that have been committed to him. Glory to God. Hallelujah. When people stop by wealth, it is because of what? The lack of trust in God. When people are careless in their spending, it is because of their lack of trust in God. Now, the word to be trustworthy means that you can be relied upon to do what is right or provide what is needed. Amen. It implies that you can be depended upon to execute a particular agenda for which money has been committed into your hands. Glory to God. Every penny in your hand, child of God, has an appointed purpose, has an appointed use. You know what? When the children of Israel were leaving Egypt, God told them to go and borrow from their neighbors silver, gold, clothing. Now, all through their journey in the wilderness, God fed them, God took care of them, God clothed them. Hallelujah. So they did not need the money for their needs. Praise the Lord. They did not need the money to meet their needs. Hallelujah. God was their source. So why did God put money in their hands? God put money in their hands for what purpose? So that when he needed the money, he could require it of their hands. When he needed to build the temple, the tabernacle, he said, go and tell them to bring an offering 
from everyone that will give you willingly. So money has a purpose in your life. I'd like to stop here tonight. Praise the Lord. And I'll trust God that when next we meet, I'll be able to complete this series. I'd like you to bow your heads and talk to God with me. Ask the Lord to give you the right purpose, the right perspective towards money. Ask the Lord to purge your heart, to purify your thinking, to help you see money from the right perspective. Ask him to give you a clear view, a clear understanding of the purpose that money is to serve in your life. Father, we thank you. Ask him to deliver you from putting your trust in money, from depending on money and not on him. Ask him to help you redirect your focus. Ask him to help you put your confidence in him and not in money. Thank you, precious Father. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching. God bless you.